three. Okay, welcome to boot camp. And today's boot camp is going to be my favorite subject, maternal newborn. But we're going to go over the things that you absolutely need to know to get through your predictor and through your NCLEX. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and pull up a PowerPoint that I made on maternal newborn and just kind of go through the anatomy and physiology of it. And, you know, like I said, the things that you need to know. So we're going to start at the beginning reproduction. It's going to be just like your fifth grade health class. <laughs> so with reproduction, when we look at the male and female reproductive systems, you need to understand that when we look at the male reproductive system, the male has a prostate gland and seminal vesicles. And that the seminal vesicles are where semen is made. And that's where the little swimmers have to get shot out like arrows to get into the mommy her vagina, which leads to the cervix. The cervix is the bottom or the mouth of the uterus. Okay, that's what the cervix is. And the little swimmers will actually swim as fast as they can through the vagina, through the cervix, and then they'll actually swim through the uterus and they will swim up the fallopian tubes because they're looking for an egg. Now, if the time is right, one of the ovaries has released an egg. I want you to know that the ovaries have all the eggs that you will ever have from the moment you are born. So females do not make eggs. The eggs are already made and they're in the ovaries. They're just waiting. They're waiting to get mature and get released. So hopefully they can find the daddy, okay? And every month, what happens is alternating ovaries will release an egg. So one month it's the right ovary, one month it's the left ovary, right? So when the egg pops out, the, the egg that's ready, mature, boom, goes into the tube. Mommy and daddy love each other. The egg and the sperm meet right there, boom. And that's conception, that's conception, right? So it's important to understand the anatomical, you know, part of this. Because when we get into things like postpartum hemorrhage and I tell you, you know, you're feeling for the fundus, well, what's the fundus? The fundus, you're just feeling the top part of the uterus, right? And if we look at a person, that is a good representation of what it looks like inside of you as far as where is it, right? The vagina, the uterus, tubes and ovaries, okay? Fertilization. So the male sperm is either an X or a Y. We only have X's, right? That's ours are all female. But then the male sperm is either a female or a male. Fertilization happens in the tube. And then here's the important part that when the egg and the sperm meet and fertilization occurs, that zygote is what it's called, has to move. And I'm going to go back to this picture again. It has to move back from the fallopian tube, go into the uterus, and then implant itself in the upper one third of the uterus. Why is that significant? Well, if it implants itself down low, we're going to talk later about things like placenta previa and abruptio placenta. If the zygote implants too low, the placenta will form down in here. Not a big deal now, but it'll be a big deal when the fetus starts to get bigger, right? So that, and I want that to make sense, right? So um, when the egg and the sperm meet, fertilization, we have 46 chromosomes, okay? We have two sets of 23, 23 from mommy and 23 from daddy. 22 of them are chromosomal sets that write your DNA. The last set of the 23rd is all about your sex. So it's either an XX, female, or it's an XY, male, okay? So that's that. So now you're pregnant, yay! How do you know you're pregnant? Positive signs of pregnancy. That means that we're positive you're pregnant, right? Positive sign, not a probable sign. Positive signs include ultrasound. In other words, we do an ultrasound and we can see the pregnancy in there. We can hear the fetal heartbeat and we can feel fetal movement. Now, just to make it clear that an outsider usually can't feel fetal movement until about four months gestation. Quickening which is when mom can start to feel something fluttering around inside of her, that's a presumptive sign of pregnancy. 
and that's usually between 16 and 19 weeks. And then you have probable signs. In other words, yeah, you're probably pregnant, but let's make sure. So the Goodell, and these are things that you need to know for the boards. The Goodell sign, that's a probable sign of pregnancy, is when the examiner does a pelvic exam on you, they're feeling for the cervix to be soft. It gets kind of soft and mushy when you're pregnant. That's a Goodell sign. Chadwick sign, another probable sign, means that the cervix starts to get a bluish, almost a purplish color because of increased blood flow, right? That's a probable sign, Chadwick sign. And then amenorrhea, when there's an A in front of a word, it means without, so no period. That's a probable sign. But they're not positive until we get either an ultrasound evidence, we can hear the heart, or we can feel the baby. All right. So, and then the other thing you need to know, Nagel's rule, and that's to estimate the delivery date. So you take the first day of the patient's last menstrual period, okay? You count backwards three months and add seven days. Back three, de back three months, add seven days. That gives you the estimated delivery date. And then this is important. During pregnancy, there's a recommendation as far as how much weight the mom should gain. And the average is somewhere around 25, even up to 30 pounds, even if the mother is diabetic. So in other words, if I have, say, type 2 diabetes and I get pregnant or type 1 diabetes and I get pregnant, I have diabetes before I've gotten pregnant. That's not gestational diabetes. I already have diabetes and now I've gotten pregnant. There is no change or difference in the amount of weight that I need to gain. It's the same. And the reason for that is, you know, the, the growing fetus has nutritional requirements that have to be met. And so even if I'm a diabetic, certainly I have to watch my sugars, right? But that has to do with simple sugars, carbs. But I still need to be gaining around the same amount of weight as someone who is not a diabetic, okay? And just FYI, from about the eighth week of gestation through delivery, you have a fetus in there, right? It's a fetus. Before that, it's a zygote, okay? Embryo, zygote, embryo, and then fetus. Around 12 weeks of gestation, if you were to do an exam on a pregnant lady, you should be able to palpate the fundus at the top of the symphysis pubis. And that's like right around where the, um, uh, the hair starts to grow. That's the symphysis pubis. You can feel the fundus right about there. At about 20 weeks of gestation, you should feel the fundus right about the level of the umbilicus. And at 36 weeks, because we're almost there, the fundus should be able to be palpated at the lower border of the rib cage, right? And these are all things that are important to know. Now, when we say, oh, the baby was premature, we mean anything before the end of the 37th week because a quote unquote normal pregnancy is between 38 and 42 weeks. 40 is the middle of the road, right? So we say you're 40 weeks, you're pregnant for 40 weeks, but it can be 38 to 42, okay? When we talk about gravita, how many pregnancies have you had, regardless of whether they were born live or not? How many times have you been pregnant? Para is how many times you've been pregnant where they reach the age of viability. And you do need to know that the age of viability is 20 weeks gestation. So in other words, at 20 weeks, there is a chance that that fetus can survive outside of mom. Viability means it can live without her. Before 20 weeks, that, that fetus cannot sustain its own life outside of the uterus. And that's important to know, okay? And then, you know, again, here's the picture a little more up close of the actual, you know, reproduction of, you know, here's the ovary, releases the egg, the egg goes here, meets the sperm, you know, zygote, embryo, and then it goes and then it implants in the wall of the uterus and it should implant right about there, okay? Now let's talk about things that can go wrong. It's amazing that most pregnancies go well, right? Because a lot of stuff can happen. Remember this, painless versus painful. Painless vaginal bleeding in the last trimester of pregnancy usually indicates placenta previa. So that means that the placenta, remember, 
it now the zygote implanted down low by the cervix. So the placenta formed either over the cervix or near it. And pressure from the fetus is causing placental insufficiency. And I'm going to go into a little more detail to make sure that you understand this, right? So painless vaginal bleeding, like the patient will say, I don't know why, but you know, like 34 weeks and I'm spotting blood. I don't have any cramps or anything. Uh, you got to get to the doctor. Now, painful vaginal bleeding, that can be an abruptio placenta. And it's just what the name implies, abruptio, abrupt. So the placenta, for whatever reason, abruptly either tears away partially or completely from the wall of the uterus. This is a life or death emergency because that placenta is the liaison between the fetus and the mom. You've got the fetus, the umbilical cord, which is attached to the placenta. The placenta is attached to the wall of the uterus. That's how the fetus gets oxygen. That's how the fetus gets food. That's how the fetus gets rid of waste. And also, I didn't put it in here, but to remember the umbilical cord, just remember the name Ava, right? That's how you can remember two arteries, one vein, Ava, A-V-A, -A, okay? Now, both of these things are bad. Placenta, abruptio placenta is worse because that is immediately, we have got to get that baby out. That is an immediate cesarean. That kid's got to come out or it will die. Now, placenta previa, it depends. So we're going to probably do an ultrasound or a CT scan because we need to see like what's going on in there. And we're going to do fetal monitoring to see if the baby is in any distress. Okay. But just remember, if it's painless, it's placenta previa. When she gets cramps or pain with it, that's abruptio placenta. And that's the worst one. That's the emergent one. And this picture kind of shows you what it should look like. This is the normal. So you've got your fetus. And the fetus, by the way, is in the right position here. Um, so right occipital anterior, or ROA is what it's called. The baby's head is right where it's supposed to be. There's your umbilical cord. And there's your placenta up in the top one third of the uterus. With an abruption, doesn't matter where the placenta is, but you see how there's blood over here? The placenta has kind of ripped away partially from the wall of the uterus, which means that it's not able to do this exchange of nutrients and oxygen and all that stuff. That's bad. This one's placenta previa. Here you see, here's the baby's head. The placenta is down here. This is considered a total previa, which means that the cervix is completely covered because here's your cervix right there where my cursor is. It's completely covered by the placenta. So the baby's head is now put in pressure. It's pushing. What will happen when mom goes into actual labor, if we didn't know that this was happening, as the uterus squeezes, squeezes the baby, right? To help push the baby out. Well, as it's squeezing the baby, it's pushing the baby down, which is pushing on the placenta. And guess what you'll see on the fetal heart rate monitoring? you'll see decelerations. And we're gonna talk about early latent variable decelerations because the baby's gonna be in distress. Every time the baby's head pushes on that placenta, it's cutting off its own oxygen, right? So hopefully that helps this make a little more sense. Two other things that can happen in pregnancy are preeclampsia and eclampsia. I need to make this one just a little bit smaller so you can see the whole slide. There we go, it's an actual one in there. There you go. Preeclampsia is also called PIH or pregnancy induced hypertension. Okay. So that means that it's a new onset of hypertension and proteinuria after the 20th week of pregnancy in somebody who never had a problem with high blood pressure before. Okay. So the criteria for the diagnosis means. What do they need to show? What are the clinical manifestations in order for us to go, yep, preeclampsia? They have to have a systolic blood pressure greater than 140 or a diastolic greater than 90. And this is a plus three protein in the urine, okay? Because protein in the urine is a big, nah, 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 nah. it's a big warning sign. When you have hypertension, and this is whether you're pregnant or not pregnant, when your blood pressure is severely elevated, it's basically beating up your kidneys. 
beating them up, not letting them do their job, putting pressure on this portal system of blood vessels that are in and around your kidneys. And it's just like somebody that says, like, boom, punch in the kidneys, boom, punch in the kidneys. Every time your heart beats the blood through. And so the kidneys will start to lose protein instead of hanging on to protein, you'll start peeing out protein. So when we see protein in urine and we can dipstick the pregnant lady's urine and check for protein, plus one, yeah, that's not good. Plus two, I'm worried. If we see plus three or greater, she is going to the hospital now because what can happen is that this preeclampsia can then lead to full-blown eclampsia which is grand mal seizures. You don't want that to happen. There's a little flow chart here that shows, you know, the kind of flow of events, all right? So that eclampsia is also a life-threatening event for mom and baby, okay? So it's really better, you know, prevention in every aspect of medicine is the best way to approach it because it's easier to prevent something than to try to fix it after it's already happened, right? So, and with blood pressure, stay away from salt. Salt is the devil, okay? Okay, so now how do we fix it? Just remember for eclampsia, this is where mom is seizing, mag sulfate, mag sulfate, mag sulfate. It's mag sulfate, okay? Mag sulfate for eclampsia, if we're just addressing the hypertension, then here is a list of meds. What do you need to know? You don't need to know all of these, but you do need to know abetalol and nicardipine, which is a calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker. Why you ask? Calcium channel blocker and beta blocker, because they will lower the blood pressure and the heart rate, right? Not just the blood pressure. And then to prevent any trauma to the mom and the baby, they're always gonna be on their lateral, or mom's gonna be in a lateral position. Left lateral is best. You're gonna put supplemental oxygen, and yeah, you're reading that right, eight to 10 liters via a non-rebreather, okay? Because we need to get oxygen in quick. And rat raised and padded bed rails, why? Because if we can't make this stop, she's gonna start to seize, okay? so. She starts to seize, we're gonna be giving her IV mag sulfate. Remember, when you think magnesium and calcium, you think nerves, just remember that line. And so we're gonna give her IV mag and don't worry about the doses, no one will ask you that. But how do we know if she's toxic? Just think about seizures. A seizure is a hyper excitation of the nervous system. Everything's right. We give you the mag and it calms down the nervous system. If we calm down the nervous system too much, then it's just as bad. So you will see hyporeflexia, hyporeflexia or sluggish deep tendon reflexes. So in other words, you're going to be monitoring the reflexes on mom to make sure that they respond quickly and appropriately. If they don't, then she could be toxic. And the antidote for mag sulfate, calcium gluconate because calcium will oppose what the mag is doing and get her back to a normal state in her neurological status. Um, I have included a list here of these meds that you need to know, right? Um, and these are all, and it's not a lot, thank God, when it comes to maternity for mom, you know, we're looking at the mag sulfate, the calcium gluconate, pitocin, pitocin stimulates contraction. So that is used to induce labor. So if you are pregnant and we are at 42 weeks and you're having eh, some contractions, but they're not doing anything, we can give you Pitocin. That will stimulate the contractions to be even more effective. And hopefully you'll have the baby. If you've had the baby and you have a postpartum hemorrhage, which we will talk about more, then methylgonervine is the drug of choice. It's only for postpartum hemorrhage. It cannot be used to induce labor because it's teratogenic and it will hurt the fetus, right? And then labetalol and nifedipine, these are the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers that we use to treat preeclampsia. They will lower the blood pressure, they will lower the heart rate, okay? 
So I'm actually going to pause, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to pause my recording for a minute. Okay, we're back. Let's go back to that PowerPoint and let's proceed with maternal newborn. Okay, so we talked about those drugs. Now, expected findings when you're pregnant. Make sure that you know these because I will tell you, especially leukorrhea, A-T-I loves leukorrhea, okay? So expected findings. These are things that you would not call the healthcare provider about because you're expecting to see them, right? So the first one is cloasma. Cloasma, they call it the mask of pregnancy. It's a hyperpigmentation, like around the bridge of the nose and the cheeks. Not everybody gets it, but some people get it. It's normal, no big deal. The linea nigra is this dark line, more noticeable in super white people than, than others, but you get this dark line that goes right from the umbilicus right down to the mons pubis. You get it during pregnancy, very common, and then it disappears after you have the baby. Leukorrhea is a thin, white or clear vaginal discharge that can occur throughout the course of the pregnancy and it's normal. It's normal. It's not a problem. There's nothing wrong. It's completely normal. Morning sickness is not the same as hyperemesis gravidarum. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Oh my God. My bad. Anyway. Morning sickness, a lot of people get morning sickness. And what it is, is you've got this big influx of hormones at the beginning of the pregnancy. So during the first trimester, sometimes a woman will feel nauseous when she's getting up in the morning. Maybe she'll vomit, maybe not. But believe it or not, and this is an ATI question, keep plain saltine crackers by the bed. And in the morning when you wake up, just take a bite of a cracker before you get up out of bed. Usually that'll help. Now, hyperemesis gravidarum, that's the extreme. That's different. That is where the mother is vomiting so much, she can't stop, that she's losing weight, she's losing electrolytes. Like this usually requires IV fluid replacement um, in order to prevent any harm to mom or baby. Okay, that's really, really important. Okay, so these are expected findings, except for I wanted to put the hyperemesis gravidarum right next to the morning sickness. So you would know, like, this is, this is normal. This one's a problem, okay? And that is the end of this one. So now the next PowerPoint that I'm gonna pull up, we're gonna talk about actual labor and delivery and just go through the things that, you know, you guys need to know. So I'm gonna stop my share for a minute and I'm gonna pull up my other PowerPoint which is this one, and, and this one is not complete, but I'm gonna complete it now. So let me share my screen and let me clear my throat. Number two, okay. So this one is about labor, right? So what is labor? Labor is the entire process of the uterus contracting, the cervix dilating and effacing, the baby being expelled and the placenta, right? That's labor. So the stages of labor, you've got four. First stage, it starts when labor starts. And in order for it to be effective, there's a loss of the mucus plug, which it's just this kind of gob of mucus that's kind of been jammed into your cervix the whole time that you were pregnant. And because you probably have been getting these Braxton Hicks or, or just like practice contractions for a little bit, now they're starting, the, the contractions are starting to do something. And so the plug will be lost. Effacement of the cervix, which means thinning. So the cervix will actually start to get thinned out. I'm gonna put in here thinning of the cervix. That's what that means. And dilation. The cervix needs to dilate to a full 10 centimeters in order to have room for that baby to come out. That's the first stage of labor. Second stage of labor begins with that dilation and ends with a baby coming out. The third stage of labor is after the baby, but that ends when the placenta comes out. And the placenta needs to come out in one piece. It's important because if it doesn't and there's any remnants of it left inside the uterus, that is a huge risk for postpartum hemorrhage. So we don't want that. 
And then the fourth stage of labor is about four hours after the placenta is delivered. And that is where, you know, everybody's trying to kind of, mom's body's trying to get back to normal a little bit. So mom should immediately begin having contractions. Yes, more contractions, but these now are to help the uterus get back to its pre-pregnant state and also to prevent any significant blood loss. Right. And that's really, really important. Right at that stage, the fourth stage of labor, when you palpate the fundus, you should be able to palpate it at the level of the umbilicus and it should be midline and firm. Those are the three things. And I'm going to actually put that here. Oh, I didn't get to it yet. Um, because it's important for you guys to know and the board and ATI loves to ask about postpartum hemorrhage. So I'm gonna put here after, after delivery is complete and that's stage four, right? The fundus should be all three of these things, midline. So it should be midline, at the level of the umbilicus. And it should be firm. It has to be all three. If one of those things is not right, there is a huge risk for a postpartum hemorrhage, okay? So if you tell me, well, it's firm and it's at the level of the umbilicus, but it's deviated a centimeter to the left, then warning, warning, warning. That's a problem. It should not be deviated to the left or to the right. It should be right midline, right in the middle, okay? And for anybody that's had a baby, you know how annoying is it when the nurse will come and you know put her hands on your abdomen and sometimes push hard. And what she's doing is two things, feeling for the fundus to see like, where is it? And also helping like move it along. Come on, contract, right? And then the other thing that we're looking at too is the lochia. And that's something that you need to know. After the baby's born, you have lochia rubra and lochia serosa. Okay. And in other words, mom will have some bleeding and that is normal, okay? Um, after the baby is born, it's usually, uh, immediately after, it's usually a red blood, right? And how do we establish how much bleeding is okay? Believe it or not, we measure the perineal pads. So we have a dry weight that we know. So like we know that the pad weighs, you know, one ounce. And then when it has blood, when it's filled with blood, believe it or not, we measure it again. And if it's got six ounces, we can do a formula to figure out how much of estimated loss of blood, right? you should never see any blood clots that are larger than a quarter. So I'm gonna put that on here. No blood clots larger than a quarter because if the blood clots are coming out, then that means that the uterus inside the lining isn't able to clot. So the blood is clotting, but the clots are just coming out of the uterus. They need to stay in there so that mom doesn't bleed. So that's why that's important, right? No blood clots larger than a quarter. And those perineal pads shouldn't be soaked, should not be soaked in a time frame that's usually more than 30 to 45 minutes. So if you are checking mom and you just changed the pad 20 minutes ago and it's soaked, again, nah, 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 and that's, that's a big red flag that you know, there's postpartum hemorrhage is coming. And this can be deadly, right? Postpartum hemorrhage can kill somebody. Um, so that's important to know. Uh, during labor, a couple things that I wanna talk about too, and this is short and sweet. You need to know what an amniotomy is. An amniotomy, mechanical rupture of membranes. In other words, your water didn't break on its own. The midwife or the doctor had to go in with this little tool, looks like a hook, through the cervix and go, and pop your bag of water or your amniotic sac. That's what an amniotomy is. The other thing you need to know, need to know, um, nitrazine strips. 
Nitrazine strips are used to identify amniotic fluid, and I'll give it to you in context. You have a patient that's 38 weeks gestation. She comes in for her checkup and she says, I don't know what's going on, but suddenly I can't hold my urine. I'm incontinent. But is she, or does she have a slow leak of amniotic fluid? What you do is you get a sample from her and you dipstick it with a nitrazine strip. That is for the board. I've never seen ATI ask about it, but I've seen the board ask about it. And it's just a dipstick, another dipstick that you dip into that urine specimen to see if there's any amniotic fluid in there because she's probably not incontinent. She may just have a slow leak. And FYI, you'll hear people say something like, you know, oh no, she'll have a dry birth. Nope. When the amniotic sac ruptures or your water breaks, however you want to look at it, um, the amniotic fluid is coming out, but more is being made, right? The big problem with a rupture of membranes, why we like people to be in a controlled environment like the hospital is risk for infection. Because once that, that bag of water or that amniotic sac is ruptured, you now, there's an open route through the vagina, through the cervix and right to the baby. And that's a problem. It's dangerous because of infection. So that's what we worry about. And sometimes the contractions are coming and the baby's starting to move down, but the bag isn't blowing. So the doctor or the nurse midwife has to go in and actually rupture them. That's the amniotomy, okay? And then slow labor. If the labor is not making the contractions count, we're gonna give you Pitocin to move it along because you can only be in labor for so long before either you or the baby is going to go into distress because labor is stressful to the body. It is, okay? Now, fetal heart rate monitoring. We put a strip or we put a, um, a, a monitor on mom and the monitor is doing two things. It's monitoring mom's contractions and I'm gonna actually show you guys a strip and it's monitoring the fetal heart rate, okay? The fetal heart rate should be accelerating it should be up if it decelerates there's a problem if the heart rate drops so a normal fetal heart rate and i should probably put that in here too oh my god normal heart rate is for a baby 110 to 160 right beats whoa, per minute whoa. oh god so i'm gonna pause for one minute Here we go. So when we're monitoring the fetal heart rate, there's something called an early deceleration that can be caused by the baby's head getting compressed during labor. Late decelerations, they're a sign of fetal hypoxia, right? and I'm actually going to highlight these so that you know that these are ones that you need to know. Late decelerations, a sign of fetal hypoxia. In other words, the fetus is not getting enough oxygen. The nursing intervention for this is that you want the mom to lay on her left side. And again, eight to 10 liters of oxygen. You know, the side lying position on the left gets pressure off the inferior vena cava. So it helps blood flow and oxygen delivery. Late decelerations are bad. That means that after the contraction is done or almost done, that's when the baby's heart rate drops significantly. So that's worrisome. Okay. She may have to have a cesarean section. Pens. Okay. This is three different situations with three different strips. And you don't have to know this, but I, again, a picture is worth a thousand words. It makes it easier as far as I'm concerned to understand. When that contraction is happening and it's pushing that fetus down, the baby's head is pushing, you know, trying to get out. When we look at the strip, we look at this is the fetal heart rate and this is. The mom's contraction, right? Contractions look like mountains, right? Because it's like the contraction starts and it gets harder, 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 and then it starts to get better and then it stops. While this is happening, see where the baby's heart rate is starting to drop? Right at the beginning of the contraction, that's an early deceleration. With this one, see the contraction over here? Baby's heart rate's dropping way over here, late. The contractions way over, a new one's getting ready to start. That's a late deceleration. And then last but not least, we have variable. Variable means a baby's heart rate is just all over the place. There's no relationship between when the heart rate is dropping 
or increasing, there's no relationship between those numbers and the mom's contractions, which is also worrisome. Let's put it this way. None of these are good, but late is the worst, variable is the next worst, and early, we got to keep a check because what's going on, right? So those are things that you need to know. And to make it easy, you remember Veal Chop. Veal Chop is an acronym that helps you remember the decelerations and what needs to be done or what's causing them. So variable, V, cord compression, right? See how they have Veal Chop? So variable, early regular accelerations, which are okay, and then late, and what's going on. So that's easy for you to remember. Just remember veal chop. The board of nursing, I mean, you may have a question, two questions that has something to do with delivery complications during delivery, which would include this, okay? I am actually gonna pause my recording because I have appointments with some other students. Pause and do questions.